Both women also hold PhDs. Please help me in welcoming Lindsay and Lexi Kite. Thank you. Hi guys. Thanks, Andrea. We're so happy to be here. We just absolutely loved our time at Utah State, and so coming back here is just like reminiscing the whole way, and the campus is amazing. It's, it's so great. We might have worked at the U for a long time, and I still work at the U. I'm Lexi, this is Lindsay, but we're Aggies. I hate to say that because it's being recorded, but <laughs> true Aggies even. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> so thanks for being here. We really appreciate it. And we hope to give you some insight into our work. The foundation of all of it is in nonprofits. How many of you here have interest in working in nonprofits in the future? Cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, quite a few of you. Um, they're booming, obviously. There are a lot of needs in the world that have to be taken care of, and there are lots of people who want to fulfill those needs. And one of the things at the root of making sure any nonprofit is successful is fundraising. So that's definitely a big part of what our careers have turned into. And we want to encourage you to consider that as a potential option. So you can see that our degrees are pretty much exactly the same, except I did journalism and women's studies, and Lexi did speech and journalism. Um, and everything else is the same until we got to our current jobs where I'm at the Clinton Foundation and Lexi is at the U College of Humanities. But we do very, very similar things, which is interesting. Yeah. We want to take you through a little bit of a timeline of just what our undergrad, masters, and PhD years look like, and then some of our post-graduation work in our careers, just to give you an idea of the kinds of opportunities we had and the skills that we gained that got us to where we are today and hopefully even bigger and better places in the future. Our first big step, like everybody's, I think, is choosing a major and just really kind of figuring out what your interest is going to be, what you will really put your work into. Um, a big part of mine was taking my first intro to news writing course from Jay Walmsley in the JCOM department. And it was my very first class of my freshman year, and I felt challenged by it. I loved it. I was, you know, I'm a real nerd for like speller gra spelling, grammar, punctuation, all that kind of stuff. And so that was, that's the course for you if you're into <laughs> that stuff. Um, but he encouraged me to go to a meeting of the Utah Statesman, the newspaper. And I went that first week of my freshman year. I ended up meeting the news editor. She encouraged me to write a column. And so I started writing just like kind of a humor column as a freshman. And I did that all four years of college. Mm -hmm. Became the copy editor for the Statesman. And that was a great thing that really got me invested in and interested in all aspects of journalism from the very beginning. And same went for me. I thought um, we are identical twins that tried desperately not to be twins when we got to college. It did not work. Despite the fact that we were sharing a dorm room. Oh, oh, it was a nightmare. So I thought I was also interested in journalism. We have the exact same skill sets, the exact same interests. But I thought I could go into broadcasting, and she mm -hmm. could go into print. And I went to um, broadcasting like that first day, and I learned all the technical skills you had to learn with like old school cameras and equipment. And I bowed out of there, and I went over to print journalism, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we remained identical in yeah. so much of what we did. Yeah. Um, the next year, I think, was really kind of not only finding what skills we wanted to develop, but what our passions really were. And we had our most identical twin moment ever when mm -hmm. we were both sitting spring semester of our freshman year. We took this course, Media Smarts, by Ted Cooper, or Brenda Cooper and Ted Peace. And it was really transformative. Is that class still taught? It's like a media literacy course. So it was mandatory for all journalism majors at the time. And I'm so glad we took it because it wasn't something that either of us were necessarily really interested in at the time. But we both sat there and our hearts pounded faster mm -hmm. as they talked to us about the ways gender, race, and violence and sexuality are represented in media and engineered in specific ways to make you think certain things. And what really resonated with us was the gender stuff. And it was especially how women's bodies were represented in mainstream media. We both recognized that we had been deeply impacted by that. We always felt just so subpar, abnormal, disgusted with ourselves, always just felt like once we reach the next weight loss goal, then we'll be happy, then we'll be, you know, achieve all the goals we want. And turns out life doesn't work that way. And we were able to have that seed planted in that classroom our freshman year. And that's kind of sparked a passion that we leaned into for a long time. Yeah. The last couple years of our undergrad were really important for us to develop these skills and opportunities that at the time, I think some of it we kind of thought was like a little monotonous, a lot of work. Um, I remember we took a grad level course in media studies that was done by Brenda Cooper. And it was overwhelming to be an undergrad and take a 5,000, 6,000 level course. But I highly encourage you to do that if you have the opportunity because having to write long research papers is key 
to being able to hone these skills and ask deeper questions, to have things to talk about with people, to be able to write a killer email, a letter, whatever it is, digital communication via typing out words to people is how we talk to each other. And you need to look good doing it. And those kind of courses where we felt like imposters, we, you always will, you will always feel like an imposter when you're starting something new. But signing up for a course like that really taught us that we could do hard things. And it really um, kind of propelled us into what we were doing for our graduate student stuff. We also had opportunities um, to do research assistant positions with professors in both of our colleges. Um, John Sider, is he? Yeah, he's, I hope to see him. Oh my gosh. John Sider is so wonderful, and I remember he asked me to be a research assistant for something, which turned into um, working as the undergrad chair of a committee to raise money for a scholarship for Harold Kinzer, this professor that was leaving, um, that was retiring at the time, and so I kind of got to step into development long before I had any idea what development even was. Um, and we also wrote for the Hard News Cafe. Is that still a thing? Probably online not. Magazine. Okay, it was an online magazine that you had to take a course to do with Nancy Williams, who retired, and we had to go be beat reporters for different cities and do city council work. We had to go to city council meetings and report on them, and then it went online, and then people from the town would email us and complain about what we wrote. <laughs> it was very overwhelming, but it, it was awesome to just be able to get out there and do stuff. So take opportunities, even when you feel overwhelmed or you feel like it's gonna be too much work or you don't know how this will translate, just get out there and get out of your comfort zone. You will learn that you can do hard things. You will also learn that the people you think are incredibly smart and intimidating might be smart, they might be a little bit intimidating, but for the most part, as you kind of rise through the ranks in different places, you realize people are just people. Nobody is so overwhelmingly smart that you could never gain their level of expertise or, or meet them on some level. People are just people, even administrators, even professors, we're all just people. And you learn that as you interact with people. Um, I started writing for the Herald Journal when I was 19, and I thought that was like the biggest win of my life. I remember calling my mom and being like, I did it, I'm done. I'm 19, I'm writing for the Herald Journal. Um, <laughs> and thankfully, I moved on from that. But it was a great place. It to was work. great. I, I ended it. up writing features for the Herald Journal as well, and like I said, stayed at the Statesman for a while. Yeah. And that was about the time we started thinking about applying for master's programs. And I think really taking that course, that grad level course in media studies, helped us kind of see ourselves in grad school um, and so we started sending out those applications in 06 that's where we took off we graduated here in December of 06 um, those were a couple of our colleagues John Rash and Jen I don't know what her last name is now but they were so great we made some really good friends here at Utah State and I hope all of you will connect with your fellow peers and also faculty as well because they'll help you forever um, letters of recommendation I found are one of the biggest things you need to really be successful, whether or not you're going to grad school, even in careers, those having those um, people that they can call from your resume, those references are crucial. Um, that was a big help to me in getting my most recent job at the Clinton Foundation. They called my references, all of them, had in-depth conversations with them. Thankfully, people said nice things about me. So um, getting good with those professors, because I had a few of those. Um, for our <laughs> master's degree, so we knew we wanted to go on to grad school. And we'll talk a little bit more um, soon about what we wanted to do with our grad degrees, but we knew we needed to like hone some expertise in, um, in a skill set. And for us, that was very much media literacy, media smarts, figuring out how we could impact the world for the better with the things that we started learning about how girls and women are presented in media and how that impacts how we feel about ourselves and how people see girls and women. Um, so we knew that we needed to apply for grad school. How many of you want to go on to grad school? Quite a few. Um, you can do it. You can do hard things. We, we did not know we could do hard things. Um, but one thing I recommend if you're going into a humanities, arts, social sciences related field, if possible, as you're entering grad school, don't accept a position without funding attached to it. Um, the best thing we did was have fellowships. So most people, when they have a fellowship, it's a research assistant position or a teaching assistant position, which we thought we would receive. Um, and when it came down to it, the professors saw these kind of personalities and skill sets we had from our undergrad work. And instead of teaching, which we didn't necessarily, that wasn't our passion, um, we did development and PR. So um, I began this work in development I had never heard of before. How many of you have heard of development, advancement, a few? 
it is an amazing career path that it seems like not that many people know about. You fall into it backwards instead of being able to just have a, a really, um, a real track to get there. And for me, I started working for a professor who was doing development for the College of Humanities. And I did that for six years through my master's and through my PhD. And Lindsay worked in the School of Music. Yeah, they put me in a basically a PR development position. Um, I worked under the director of development for the School of Music. I didn't know anything about music, but I had taken a PR class and I obviously had written for newspapers and things like that, so they thought I could do it. Some imposter syndrome for sure kicked in because I also taught the capstone PR course at um, the U for undergrads and I was their same age or younger, so you know, <laughs> establishing authority in that position is kind of hard, but um, it worked out fine and we did a lot of work for nonprofits. And so that was kind of a little foray into what it means to market a nonprofit, find um, the stakeholders, understand what their interests are, and then also find donors. A lot of that started even on a small level in doing PR for the School of Music and teaching it. But I do remember when I was teaching that PR course, I used to kind of breeze past the whole section on development because my eyes would glaze over when I thought about fundraising. Like mm -hmm. that's not something that's super interesting to a lot of people. Um, I found myself in that career a couple years later and it turns out that it's very interesting and fun and not at all what I expected. Um, so we'll tell you a little bit more about that. But in grad school, um, at that very beginning, we had to kind of find our niche. Because a lot of times you go in and you have this really broad idea of what your interest is. It might be some huge subject area, like ours was body image or media studies. And to be successful in grad school, you have to find such a narrow little niche where you can dig in and become a real expert and learn everything about it. And I think that's one of the real joys of grad school, is being able to just um, go an inch wide and a mile deep into one subject where you can really become the pro and a credible source on that by learning what other people have done. So from the very beginning, we had to decide if we were going to do a project or a thesis, um, and it kind of signifies what your career will end up as. If you do a thesis, that leads you into an academic career. But Lexi and I both weren't super interested in becoming professors um, and doing like the teaching and research side of things. We wanted to do the research, but then we wanted to take it to the larger world. And so we did a project and we were able to work together. So it was like twice the size of a regular project plus half a thesis. And we worked together the whole time and fought the entire way. Yeah. But um, it worked out pretty nicely because we were able to walk out of there with this tangible presentation that we could take to any audience that's backed by tons of research, a committee of professors that had had to review it, we had to defend it, mm -hmm. and um, that helped us solidify our vision, but also our plan for the future. Not straight into university, not that there's anything wrong with that, but a little bit um, more public about it. Um, and the going public part of it entailed, um, in 2009, when we graduated with our master's degrees, we decided that we were going to take our research, we had been writing these papers, um, we had been talking about them in grad seminars, presenting them to our peers, and we knew that this research was relevant and important to a lot of people, and it was time to just make it bite-sized and put it on the internet. And so we started blogging under the name Beauty Redefined, um, and that started to kind of take off because people were interested in some of these issues we were bringing up because they were timely. Um, we would hook it into like celebrity news stories um, and controversies that were going on in tabloids, all that kind of stuff, and it helped us to start doing some presentations. This picture here, you can't see it very well. That's probably good. But um, it's one of our very first presentations <laughs> that we did here at Utah State in a little, it was a class. I think it was probably one of Brenda or Ted's classes, yeah. um, but a very old version of our presentation. Yeah, things have come a long way in the um, 11 years since. If you saw our presentation from then, it was pretty elementary. It was good for the time. Nobody was talking about body image at the time, so it was great. Um, but things have changed a lot since then. But that presentation, that basis, all of that research we did um, has since kind of spiraled into what we still do and what we'll be doing tonight. And it's become a presentation that we've taken to universities across the country. We've had really amazing experiences being able to share our message. Mm -hmm. um, so the PhD kind of helped propel us there as well. In, in 20, uh, 2009, 10, we started continuing to kind of solidify our path and presenting at conferences. We narrowed our focus to figure out exactly what made our hearts pound faster. I think that's something that you should really consider with what you're, do with what you're doing, with whatever you're researching, whatever you wanna do career-wise. Think about the thing that makes your heart pound a little faster, that gets you a little bit of an adrenaline rush, that makes you feel like, oh, I could, I could do this. Either it makes me really excited, it helps me realize that I can make a difference in the world, I can contribute good in some way. Whatever the thing is, go toward that. 
if you can just feel called to the work you're doing, oh, it makes your whole life so much more meaningful and it makes your career a lot more sustainable. So um, we continued to share our work online and built our expertise. We definitely decided that we were gonna go more of the public intellectual route rather than the very academic route. We wanted to share our work beyond just peer reviewed journals, which is peer reviewed journals are awesome, um, but we needed to get our work out to a broader audience. And so we started doing um, a lot of speaking engagements and a lot of publicity. When we'd write about something that was big in the news, then the news stations would call us or AP would call us and we would get a ton of publicity for some of the stuff we were doing. And being able to do that and accept those opportunities, one time we were on vacation in LA and a CNBC reporter called us and said, I want to interview you for this um, campaign you're doing right now. And so we, they sent a car to us at our hotel, and we went to CNBC to a news station and did a live interview. About Carl's Jr. <laughs> when Carl's Jr. used to just be totally objectifying and terrible. And that just was on fire. Associated Press picked it up. It was wild. And these were opportunities that we just took, even though there was a big part of us that was like, no, I can't do this. People are going to be mean to us online. And they were. And they were. <laughs> and they still are, but it turns out. Try being a feminist on the it. internet. <laughs> we recommend it. We also continued to build our brand. One of the big ways we did that in 2012 was we had a billboard campaign. We were sick of driving past all the plastic surgery billboards on I-15. And so we recognized a lot of other people felt the same way. And people from out of state were also shocked by all the billboards on I-15. Yeah. It just doesn't look like what you'd expect Utah to look like. So we um, decided that we were going to just raise money for one billboard on I-15 and that it would have a positive message from our nonprofit. And instead, we were able to raise enough money for 12 of them that we got from Logan to Provo, mm -hmm. and then one on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, because this guy <laughs> in Pennsylvania owned a billboard, yeah. and he contacted us, said he had heard about it from the news, and wanted to put one up. So we did. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> we never got to see it in person, but so great. We had a billboard on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. <laughs> um, so that helped kind of propel us further. People started to recognize our name a little bit more. And that's what we have done since 2009, and I think we'll probably continue doing it forever. Um, mm -hmm. The day-to-day -day of Beauty Redefined, our nonprofit, has changed a little bit, and we kind of have had to hang on to um, just the most important things because we do have these other full-time jobs. Beauty Redefined has been our part-time gig all this time. Um, and it doesn't mean we haven't done it in our offices plenty of times and had to take a lot of time off work to be able to go do speaking events and, you know, like this and all of that, but we really love it. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what we do is speaking gigs. Uh, we travel all around the country, speak at universities, treatment centers, school districts, whatever. Um, we do a lot of social media engagement. This has grown our audience more than anything has. Like word of mouth is great, but social media will take you to another level. And that's been really important for us. It's also the thing I hate the most. I, I hate having to engage with everyone on social media because you get a few of those negative comments and those trolls and oh, I can't handle it. Lexi can, thank goodness. <laughs> so she has been able to take over while I'm like, I need a break. Lindsay took a year Ooh, off. I took a year off. And it was too much. It was too much. <laughs> I took it on. And yeah, some of that stuff is difficult, but when you're thinking about a nonprofit, which we founded in 2009, um, and there's like the paperwork that goes into it and the creation of an actual nonprofit is a whole other deal. But we were trying to figure out whether we go full time into our passion and we make Beauty Redefined have to pay the bills for us, to pay, you know, we needed a salary, or if we kind of leaned into a full time job and had Beauty Redefined as a passion project on the side. And for us, the more sustainable option was very much that we leaned into full time careers that were still meaningful for us. Um, so in 2013, when we graduated with our PhDs, I was offered my boss's job. He was retiring and he was the development director. And they offered me his job. I had never considered development as an option I really wanted to pursue. It just didn't really light a fire underneath me. But I took it because I realized, oh my gosh, I'm graduating. Like I'm leaving 10 years of academia and I need to do something. So I took that job. And it was one of the best choices I've ever made. Um, I have now, uh, after um, my boss retired and I had his position, six months later, the director of development for the entire college um, moved away to another position and I was promoted to her position. So within a year, I went from development assistant, development officer, director of development. And that's where I've been ever since. And that was overwhelming, 
but I had the skill set, the foundational skill set that started right here that allowed me to succeed in that position. And of course, I'll continue to grow and succeed and hopefully do even better in that work. But if you want a career in development or advancement or nonprofit work, it can really start right here with your humanities, arts, and social sciences degrees. I joined Lexi at the College of Humanities as their development officer in 2015, and I left there in 2019 when I decided I didn't want to live in Salt Lake anymore, I wanted to live in New York City, and so I was going <laughs> to figure out how to do that. Um, I ended up actually making that move and getting an apartment and everything, and then was offered my job at the Clinton Foundation, mm -hmm. which just was the most exciting thing. Mm -hmm. It was so thrilling. Um, so the Clinton Foundation does work all over the world. A big thing that we're known for is hurricane recovery in the Caribbean. Um, so we fundraise for that. Um, the, the whole foundation works on a partnership model. So it's based on the influence and the connections of the Clintons. Um, when President Clinton left office, he knew that there were a lot of problems yet to be solved that his administration couldn't fully tackle. But he knew the people to do it, and he knew how to get the right people in the room. So that is what our foundation does. We get the right people in the room, we fundraise to be able to make these collaborations happen, and then carry out the work on the ground, whether it's in early childhood education, um, for little kids learning to read before they get to kindergarten so they can have an advantage, um, or opioid addiction, this crisis that um, the foundation is helping to kind of put a foot down on. Um, all of this is the same kind of development stuff that I did at the University of Utah and that Lexi did also. The big things that we really do are build relationships with donors. And at first it might sound kind of schmoozy or like there's obviously there's an end goal when it comes to those relationships. But when it comes down to it, we're not talking to anybody who doesn't know exactly what we're there for. We're super transparent about what we're doing. When I'm emailing someone, too many emails like I mentioned, when I'm emailing someone to get a lunch with them in Austin next week, they know that I'm there representing our annual giving program for donors who will give between one and $10,000 to sustain all of our work worldwide. So I talk to them about the work and I ask them if they would be willing to contribute between one and $10,000. I usually have a specific ask for them, but they recognize that this is philanthropy. You know, um, This relationship, it does certainly have an end goal because we want them to contribute to our work. But what it comes down to is just having genuine conversations with people, being really sincere and upfront about what I'm there for, what we're doing and the good that it does. Yeah. Um, we also, a big thing that we learned in journalism especially, is the ability to develop a proficiency in a lot of different areas. So when you're writing a news story about something that you know nothing about, you go find the right sources, you read up on it first, and then you talk to people and you ask meaningful questions and you listen. And that is still what we do in development, whether it's with professors that we're working on behalf of, or the Clintons, or the people who are actually on the ground doing the work um, in opioid addiction or in hurricane recovery. We find out what their interests are, what their expertise is, and then we go represent that to the people that we're speaking to um, who are donors. And a, part, a big part of that is just communicating persuasively, being able to be engaging and convince people that our work is important and we need them to get on board to make it even more effective. Yeah. I would say our day-to-days look like a ton of emails, even less, we're millennials, so phone calls don't love. Very good. <laughs> yeah. We love an email. Um, so it's a lot of that. It's a lot of meeting people face-to-face -to, -face, um, to cultivate these relationships, to talk about the things they're interested in and really listen to them. Listening is so important. I remember I took a listening class when I was here. I bet they don't teach it anymore. Anybody know? Probably not, because that professor is retired. But at the time I thought, really a class on listening and it was an easy class okay <laughs> but my goodness when you realize how important listening is in a conversation to really be able to interact with somebody by nodding and listening and asking questions about what they have said to build upon the conversation and not just kind of float off or insert your own experience and not go back to them mm -hmm. it is so important in any line of work any line of work at all so i i think listening is incredibly important um, and I think being able to understand somebody's passion and kind of put those puzzle pieces together when you're talking to somebody and listening is going to help you get there. Mm -hmm. So the foundational skills that you are learning now, I can't say it enough. Um, you may have heard this stat before, but the average person these days is going to change career path six times over the course of their lives. So we're talking career, not just job within a specific career, but careers. So while you could go to a STEM degree and you could learn a very particular skill set that will um, age out very rapidly, instead you can, and of course we want you to do that too, but these kind of more broad-based skills 
the ability to think critically, to write, to communicate, to listen, to ask hard questions. These skills are everything. They will translate into any future job you have. And if you can present yourself well, if you can speak to people with confidence, if you can work well with other people and just be personable, just be a person that can be happy and uplifting and fun to be around, you're gonna get the job over somebody who looks down at their feet and mumbles and knows exactly how to solve the problem but doesn't know how to interact with other people. And that's what people across the board tell us. At the College of Humanities, at the rival school, at the U, um, we have a ton of alums who have gone on to be CEOs of big tech companies. One of them is the president of Nintendo. And he, I was just at a meeting with him a couple weeks ago, and he told me that when they are hiring people, what they're looking for are these humanity skills. That's what we hear just across the board. So keep that in mind. This is an incredibly valuable career path, an actual career path, not just something fun where you can read literature on the side or whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. So that is pretty much our whole path, but we welcome your questions. Happy to answer anything about nonprofits, whether it's beauty redefined or development, anything else. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. <laughs>
evolved over time. It wasn't like we were coming here trying to have one specific message that we know we're going to stick with forever. Mm -hmm. We had some ideas of what we wanted to do. And we created a really crappy logo. <laughs> it looked like a Barbie logo, basically. <laughs> um, it was not great. But we had to have something, like especially for our billboards. Yeah. Um, we had to have some type of branding. So we knew that our name was going to be Beauty Redefined. We felt like that was catchy. Um, we felt like people could kind of envision what that means to redefine what beauty is, that name doesn't work perfectly for us anymore. Yeah. Um, I guess you'll be the first to know we're going to start um, transitioning into the name More Than a Body in uh, over probably the next couple of years because we have really established Beauty Redefined as our name. But we're writing a book um, called More Than a Body, that's the title, um, and that's through Houghton Mifflin Harcourt and it'll be published at the end of 2020 or the very beginning of 2021. Mm -hmm. We're very, very excited about that. Mm -hmm. um, but we're trying, we've been working to establish ourselves as people who move the conversation beyond beauty, like from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And so when we say beauty redefined, what we mean is redefining the meaning and value of beauty in our lives. But a lot of people from the branding perspective see that and think, oh, we're just going to say that these types of bodies are also beautiful or these types of bodies, you know, aren't as in fashion or whatever. Um, and we've had to really work hard to establish our brand as being something that's beyond that, using certain hashtags, mm -hmm. catchphrases, and always bringing everything back to our foundational view that women are more than just bodies, and when we can see more in ourselves, we can be more. So the conversation might be about something totally tangential to that that's going on in the news, some controversy or whatever, mm -hmm. but the branding relies on us um, always sticking to that same message that women are more than bodies. And from a funding perspective, Raising money for your own nonprofit, at least for me, is so much harder than raising money for an already established institution, you know? No. Raising money for our own nonprofit has looked like um, not <laughs> raising money. <laughs> we don't ask people for donations. We, I mean, on giving day, we'll throw something out online. But our nonprofit is funded through speaking events. So Utah State is helping us um, keep Beauty Redefined moving forward. Um, and also through merchandise and online course sales. So we decided a long time ago, we weren't going to grant right, we weren't going to just be in the grind 24-7 for BR because that would suck the passion out of what we were doing. Yeah. We um, make our money through our full-time jobs, Yeah. and then we put all of the Beauty Redefined money back in Beauty Redefined. We give our course away for free to so many people, mm -hmm. um, we get it in classrooms, um, we do speaking events for schools a lot of times for free for other community groups that ask for it, mm -hmm. and so we try to keep the nonprofit side of things our real passion. We really felt like if we relied on it for our health insurance and our 401k that we were going to hate it and we would probably quit. And I think I would have quit at this uh -huh. point. So it's actually been really good for us to have full-time gigs that are totally separate from Beauty Redefined. And I think that'll keep the passion project alive for a long time. Yeah. yeah. And that's something for you guys to consider, like whether you want to go full on into your passion project or not. And I think you can be happy either way. Mm -hmm. I think we are a testament to the fact that you can because we've also made sure that we're in meaningful careers. If that's important to you, in something meaningful, something that contributes, maybe it's not important to you, but if it is, find a way to go that route. The doors will open to help you get there. They always do. Was there another question? Yeah. Um, switching gears a little bit, sounds like you guys have a really full plate with your full-time job and this. What is your work-life balance? Life and how have you how have you managed your passion project and your life? Yeah. Well, I had a baby two and a half months ago too. Um, so yeah, it's work a life hard balance is a lot. Uh -huh. <laughs> I have a very supportive partner. I think um, having uh, if you have a partner, making sure that they are your equal partner, your equal half, is wildly important. I got lucky in that regard. Um, but I think that we our jobs kind of allow us to to be a little bit flexible we take time off we wouldn't be in a job where we had to be there nine to five somebody was watching the clock and we couldn't take time off yeah. because this is so important to us in the college i think it helps that uh, in the college of humanities at the u i think it helps that we're alums and people can see um the work we're doing and that we're alums and this is the kind of thing you can do mm -hmm. Yeah, mine's a little easier. I don't have kids or a husband, so uh, that helps. I can do whatever I want with my time. Um, I'm jealous. Yeah, my job is like uh, basically like a 10 to 5.30 sort of thing, and I can take breaks to do podcast interviews or whatever. And I do get to travel for my job, so I've tacked on a Texas trip to this one. I'll go visit like eight donors in Texas next week, and it, it works. You know, uh, that's been 
a really good thing, but I've also had to draw some boundaries in my life yeah. over um, what times I will allow myself to do Beauty Redefined. Because if I come home from my full-time job and I've had a stressful day and I have to spend the next six hours working on something online for BR, it kills me. Like it is just, it's so draining and exhausting. And I really hit a wall last year. And that's when I decided to move to New York. So I like changed my whole life as a result of hitting that wall. Um, but it's been amazing. So I would suggest just having some boundaries around what hours you're willing to look at comments online or, you know, um, respond to emails or whatever else. Online, yeah, that's easier. probably the rule. Just don't look at comments. Yeah, I guess that's it. <laughs> yeah. How, with Beauty Redefined, how do you separate that brand versus like the Utah blog and mom? Yeah, yeah, we're kind of the opposite. <laughs> yeah, like our branding is not body focused. So the whole more than a body thing means that we're not posting pictures of ourselves online. Um, we're not sharing pictures of other people's bodies. Um, we one thing that's differentiated us in kind of an obvious way is that sometimes we'll call out those bloggers who yeah. are doing things mm -hmm. that are perpetuating really harmful ideals about bodies because a lot of times they're they're selling the flat tummy tea um, or a detox or a mm -hmm. you know full body workout bikini body whatever um, and so we do sometimes call those out when they become really prominent and so that has established us as maybe a more critical voice in the realm because sometimes I think they might look at us and see like oh blonde girls from Utah they probably fit right into that like blogger mode but we what we're doing and what we're saying is very very different from that and a lot of times those bloggers suffer with serious body image issues themselves totally. mm -hmm. or they'll have daughters or sons that are struggling with it and so then they look to us for advice on that and thankfully they've been super supportive and a lot of them yeah. will share our stuff and amplify our voices which has been really really great I think we kind of go hand in hand it should be like a symbiotic relationship um, because like we need each other we need to keep each other in check when we all have this influence on social media we should be able to make sure that it's empowering and it's supporting people and you know we yeah. support each other did we miss anyone? I think Good. time's probably up. Yeah. Thank you Thank guys you for, for being coming. here.